try so hard to fix all the things I've done. Every mistake, every disaster, when I'm running away. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks. Do you know what? There's a nice little crowd over there. Look, I'm like, oh, looking in all directions. Good morning, everyone. Are we good this morning? Yeah, are we pleased to be here? Yes, that's good. Welcome to, if you're joining us on the live stream, um, we're really pleased that you're joining us today. We're really looking forward to a great morning together. Are you ready for a good morning together? Yes, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And this morning we're going to be worshipping and Gareth's going to be preaching. Lottie is going to be leading us in communion. And um, we're really looking forward to hearing what God wants to say to us this morning. And um, before we move on, I do need to just comment on a little row over here of, what is it just three, four, four in a row with their England tops on? Very excited. Anybody else? Anyone else a bit excited for tonight? Who's, yes, I love it. Who's watching tonight? Who's planning to watch? Oh, is there anyone not planning to watch? Oh, there's a few. Are we just really not football fans? You see, I'm not a football fan, but I have to say, I am very excited as well. We'll see. I normally spend the first half hour just like on my phone scrolling something else, you know, just keeping an eye, and then it gets a bit more exciting. But we're looking forward to tonight. I don't, well, who do we think is going to win? What do we reckon? Good, good response. That's right. <laughs> we'll just wait and see. I'm kind of um, glad it's later on this evening. It wasn't last night. Who knows what... That's a bit pessimistic of me, isn't it? Who knows what? <gasps> anyway, let's stop talking about football. Who knows what's going to happen? But um, good to hear that we're all excited and ready for that this evening. It is great to have so many of you here in the room. We want to really welcome you this morning um, for our service and our time together. I think a lot of people are familiar with our setup. Um, 
heading out that door is for the toilets and then your one-way system back through into this hall. We've got creche this morning, so later on um, when Gareth comes to preach, creche children will be heading out the hall. Kids, you're going to be outside this morning. Very exciting. Bit of a celebration, a bit of party. Anna's excited. Sounds like it's going to be great out there. So kids, when the time comes, you're going to be heading out the back door over there and heading outside. Anyway, do you know what? I would like to just um, read a verse that I've been reading this week and um, just a really great verse of words that Jesus said. And I want to read this and share this as we come to just focus on God this morning. And it's from John 16, verse 33, where Jesus says these words, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. So I'm going to pause there for a moment. Jesus, do you know in another place he says, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. This morning Jesus wants to give us peace. Maybe you're needing that this morning. He then goes on and says, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. Do you know, I love that Jesus tells us this. He knew that life was not going to be easy. He never said it would be easy. He never said it would be a bed of roses. He said, you know, it's going to be tough, but the next bit comes. But take heart because I have overcome the world. Wow. (laughs) Take heart because I have overcome the world. I think some of us need to just hear that this morning. Life might be tough. There's going to be trials, there's going to be sorrows, but, oh, Jesus, Jesus himself is saying, come on, take heart, I have overcome, he's won the victory, we're not doing life on our own, we have Jesus, who has overcome the world, overcome death, he has won the victory, and he walks with us. Wow, (laughs) what a great reminder this morning. So as we come into our songs and our worship, let's just take hold of that this morning. Whatever life is thrown at you right now, take heart, be encouraged, have courage because he's overcome. Will you stand with us as we lead into our worship? And I'm going to pray. So let's stand together. I'm going to pray and then hide in the band. I'm going to just lead us in some songs to just worship God this morning. Oh, Jesus, I want to thank you for these words this morning. Thank you that you give us peace. And thank you, Jesus, that you have overcome the world. Oh, we just want to stand in the truth of that this morning. May we all just take hold of that for ourselves, take hold of that into our hearts And stand knowing that, Jesus, you have won the victory and you walk life with us. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Amen. Thanks, Heidi. Amen. Well, I woke up with uh, the words this morning, peace, bring it all to peace. And uh, it does not fit in with any of the set I'd already planned so seamlessly to so um, after Mary Jane's read that, I just said to the team, we've got to sing. We've got to sing this song, so bear with us. Okay, peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it pray. At your name and still, call the sea to still. The rage in me to still. Every way at your name, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence me, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Call these bones to live, call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You make 
the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus You silence me Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus Your name, your name is a light that the shadows can't deny Your name cannot be overcome And your name is alive Forever lifted high Your name cannot be overcome Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble
listen wondering to all my fear and unbelief your faithfulness appears to me again mountain top and valley low in every season this i know your goodness like the dawn will break again oh your mercy is rising in this heart again my soul begins to sing they are new every morning new every morning great is your faithfulness your mercies are new every morning new every morning great is your faithfulness and every good and perfect gift in your endless grace you give flowing from the father's heart to mine beams of heaven as i go through all this wilderness below fullness of your love for all the time oh, your mercies oh your mercy is rising in this heart again oh your mercy oh your mercy is rising in this heart again for your mercy's rising forever shining in this grateful heart again they are new every morning new every morning great is your faithfulness your mercies are new every morning new every morning Great is your faithfulness. Sing it again. For they are new every morning. New every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning. New every morning. Great is your faithfulness.
are the king of our hearts, Lord. You are the ruler of all. You are king in this place, king of kings and lord of lords. We lift you up this morning. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise.
was asked to come and lead communion, I felt like I really wanted to share something that I think about every single time um, that we take communion. And it's something that happened when I was quite young. Um, In my home church, they often used to quote that verse that Paul talks about in Corinthians about examining yourself before you take communion. It said, examine yourself. Um, And I just, when I was younger, I used to think, I actually used to find that quite difficult to accept. And I used to go one of two ways. I used to either um, examine myself and think, oh, Lord, I've, I've really messed up this week. I'm, I've done this, I've not forgiven this person, or I've, you know, whatever it was. Um, and I looked at myself and I thought, no, I'm not, I'm not worthy enough to take this. Um, or I went the other way and I said, oh, Lord, I've had a great week this week. I totally deserve this, yeah. Um, and then I, I spoke about it with a lady from my, my church that I grew up in. And she sort of turned around and said, I think you're looking at this the wrong way. When it says examine yourself, it's asking you to, to look at yourself at, like, in the, the version of yourself that's covered in Christ. That, um, that when Jesus died for you, it's that you put on his clothes. You put on his love that he did for you, that he died for you. And so that you no longer have to examine yourself because you're just, you're totally loved and covered by him. And it reminded me of that, that song that it says, in royal robes I don't deserve. Um, and when I, whenever I have communion now, I sort of, I have to stop myself from judging myself because that's God's job. Like I've totally, I'm trying to surrender the role of judge to him. Um, and I look at myself in Christ's clothes that I'm covered by him because of what he did. And so as we, um, as we take communion together, I just want to challenge you to sort of picture yourself in Christ's clothes, in his robes that are, have covered everything that you've done. He's taking it on himself so that we can stand here and be in communion with him. Um, So I'm just going to read some words from from Luke about the Last Supper. But as we do that, just picture yourself in Christ's robes um, and eat and drink together. So when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said... Take this and divide this among you, for I tell you I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Father, we just thank you so much for this this act that we get to do to remember what you did for us. Lord, forgive us for when we forget. (laughs) Forgive us for when we don't remember what you did and we start to judge ourselves and take the place of you as judge. God, forgive us for that. Help us to turn it around, to, to put on the robes that you have given us freely and to accept this gift. And Lord, we just thank you so much for that. Yeah, and Father, just as we continue to worship, would you help us to picture ourselves like you picture us, dearly loved and saved by your sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing that again in a minute, but I just, I wonder if we could just be still and listen to bit more to grant ministering on that keyboard because Jesus just wants to minister peace. Thank you. 
yourself. Jesus said these words, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. That's what he said himself, come to me. That's what we've done this morning. That's what we're called to do, to come to him Jesus, we thank you that we can come to you, that our hope can be in you, that you're our constant saviour, you're our friend forever. Thank you that you know what we need. And when we need rest, you give us rest. When we need hope, you give us hope. When we need peace, you give us peace. We thank you this morning for who you are, Jesus, for who you are to us. Amen. Amen. We're going to be moving on to Gareth. He's going to bring our word this morning, um, which we're really looking forward to. Thank you, Heidi and the band but just, yeah, leading us so beautifully into the presence of God. Um, whilst Gareth's getting himself sorted, children, 
um, if you are preschool age, so anyone that's not at school yet, you can head to the back door there. Um, there is also a screen if parents feel they want to go. You can watch on the screen whilst your children are being... Oh, I was going to say entertained, not quite entertained, whatever the word is. <laughs> um, I know that they've got some wonderful things planned, some ministry. Kids, over this way, you're going to head outside. I bet you're going to have a fun time with Tasha and Anna. I'm excited. I feel like I want to come and join you. Um, yeah, you know, you're hovering behind me. I might just go sit down. <laughs> I'm just going to go. Um, I'm going to hand over to Gareth. There we go. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. It's great to be uh, able to worship together and uh, spend this time in God's presence. And uh, as you know, last week I began a series of teaching on the kingdom of God. I'll probably finish today, but we might return to this a bit later. Who knows? But uh, I, I just wanted to read to you as we begin from um, Galatians chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to read verse 1 to 14, so quite a long passage here. But um, this is Paul writing to the church at, uh, at Galatia, or in, actually in Asia Minor. He wrote to several churches in one go. And it was after his first missionary journey. These were the first churches he had planted. And... In that area, the Jews, some of the Jews had followed and tried to get the new Christians to be following the law and uh, to be circumcised and all of those things. This is what Paul writes uh, to them. It says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Christ. In the same way, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures look forward to this time when God would declare the Gentiles to be righteous because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham believed, uh, received because of his faith. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are, that are written in God's book of the law. So it's clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say it's through faith that a righteous person has life. This way of life is very different from the way of law, which says it's through obeying the law that a person has life. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law when he was hung on the cross. He took, it, uh, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing, for it is written in the scripture, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same, prom with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Steve, could I have a little bit of my microphone through my fold back, please? I'm just hearing subs. Great. I, um, you know, ultimately the gospel is, is, uh, is God's good news. It's God's restoration plan to restore the kingdom of of God. Last week we were uh, looking at the nature of the kingdom and the nature of a king. And uh, uh, you can go and listen to that online to hear that in full. But it's God's plan to reconcile the world to its king, to restore his kingdom. 
So God is king, is still king, but we are divided, separated from him unless we choose to return to him. And, and last week we looked at sort of three things about the kingdom of God. First of all, God is sovereign. God makes the decisions, not us. He is the one who makes the rules. He has all power and all authority, and we do not have it. That's pretty simple. The second thing is that God is in control, and he controls all things. And the third is this, it's a voluntary kingdom. We choose if we are subject to him or not. And you can go back and listen to last week's message on the Facebook page or on the website and, uh, and just hear that in more detail. But those are, the, in a sense, that's the, the foundation of what I'm going to be sharing today. And uh, as we looked at last week, Adam's sin took us out of the kingdom of God and, and, and into the kingdom of Satan. David says in, in uh, Psalm 139, I was born in sin. And that's where we have the, uh, the doctrine of, uh, of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Why can I not think of the doctrine? Original sin, that's the one I'm trying to... <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, too much coffee, my brain won't make the connections this morning. But here's the thing, the kingdom of God is still there. God's kingdom didn't exist because Adam and Eve didn't stop existing because Adam and Eve chose to put themselves outside of it. God's kingdom didn't stop to existing because Satan and a third of the angels chose to put themselves outside of it. He still rules and he still reigns. He's still in authority with all power and all knowledge and all of the things that we know about the nature of God. And so since that time, God has been working on his plan to restore his subjects to his kingdom. And so in a sense, the, 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 what we saw last week about God's kingdom and the fact that it's a voluntary one, God's plan is that we are all restored, that each one of us is restored to the kingdom of God. And so that is what he has been doing. And so this morning I've just read to you from Galatians. We'll return to that in more detail later. But it compares the law of Moses to what Jesus did on the cross. And in a sense, the law of Moses was phase one, if you like, of the plan to restore. And here we have the kingdom of Israel. If you're writing notes, just write that down. The kingdom of Israel. Phase one of the plan. God chose a nations to be a means of a nation to be the means of his solution to restore us. And it, we read there in, in Galatians, Abraham, uh, 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 God said to Abraham, uh, verse uh, 8 or 9, Abra uh, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. And, uh, you know, it, Paul writes in another place that that, it didn't, it was through the child of Abraham, singular. That obviously is Jesus. And so through Jesus, the whole world will be blessed. So from, from Abraham's offspring, through the nation of Israel, comes Jesus. And so this is the beginning, if you like, or the, the first phase of God's plan. God becomes king to a nation. And this is uh, perhaps... Uh, one of the things I just want to just dwell on for a moment. The people of Israel, we, you know, are known, they're known as the chosen people. They're chosen for a couple of things. First of all, for God to rule over them. And they, when they make the covenant, when Moses makes a covenant at Mount Sinai, they voluntarily say, yes, you are our king, we will serve you. That is, in a sense, the plan for, uh, you know, th that's what God is doing. Uh, and so, so at, at that moment, when they were given the law at Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments and all of those things, Moses said to the people, are you going to serve him? And they said, yes, we will. And then later, when Joshua became leader, he said again, are you going to serve him? We know it well, didn't it? As for me and my house, he said, we will serve the Lord. And they said, yes, we will serve him. We will be subject to him as our king. 
And so the people, and we've, we've heard this before, the people of Israel, in a sense, have got two purposes. One is to serve the king, and the other is to be a prophet, or to be prophets to the whole, and priests to the whole of the world. And in a sense, the plan, God's plan was that they would be priests, and they would lead the rest of the world to God. And, and, uh, and as we uh, can see, they didn't quite succeed there, and that is why Jesus came, we'll look at in a moment. So God becomes king of a nation and he rescues them by his miraculous power. His sovereignty is shown. You know, when he, they're slaves in Egypt and God brings all of these miracles, you know, those ten plagues and all of that that, you know, we, 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 we read about in our Bible, we watch it on the films and all of those things. God brings these miracles to rescue his people. His sovereignty, his power, his authority is shown here by miraculous power. And he, if anything, he's demonstrating, I am king. I can do what I like. You know, Egypt was maybe the, 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 the leading world power at the time, certainly one of the leading world powers at the time. We don't know, you know everything about history. And yet God shows to Pharaoh, I'm in charge. And he rescues his people. And he brings them out of Egypt and he gets them to Sinai and he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. I wrote in my notes here something that I read in a book I, I mentioned here last week from David Pawson. Um, a release and demand. God releases them from slavery, but then he demands from them that they serve him. And he gives them the commandments. And, uh, and they are commanded to follow these laws, but they voluntarily agree to do so as well. But in a sense, that's what we see of the Old Testament. Sovereignty and then subject. God demonstrates his sovereign power, and then the people are called to be subject to his authority, to be become if you like, subject by following the rules, the commandments in the Old Testament uh, that God gave to Moses. And so here in the Old Testament, we see this pattern. First of all, God does something, and then the people are called to serve, called to follow, called to be obedient. And if you read in Deuteronomy, I think it's 28, 29, it might be 27, 28, there's a long passage and it's and the title in your bible probably says blessings for obedience curses for disobedience or something like that because god in a sense is calling on his people says if you obey me you know i've done all these incredible miracles i've got you out of egypt i've led you through and i've got you into the uh, you know deuteronomy was just before they went into the promised land and he was just about to do all this stuff. He says, if you obey my commands, I will bless you. I will give you crops. I'll multiply your families. I'll, you know, I'll make th this kingdom of Israel the best kingdom in the world, if you like. And yet, at the same time, he says, but if you don't obey me, there'll be curses on you. Because in the Old Testament, that's how it was. God shows his sovereign power. Then he expects people to follow his commandments. And as I spoke about last week, the kingdom of Israel was birthed as a theocracy. God is king. I mentioned that already. God is king over Israel. And, and through this first period of the nation of Israel, we see that God is king and his prophets were his messengers. So Moses wasn't king. Moses was a prophet and he would go to the mountain, he would hear from God's voice or he would go to the, the tent of meeting and he would hear God's voice and he would tell the people what God said. That was the nature of the nation of Israel at that time. They were people who God ruled over. And, and, and the prophet, whoever it was, Moses or Joshua or Samuel, would hear what God says and tell the people what God was saying. There's a, there's a and this is in the passage in Exodus about, uh, or Leviticus about uh, the making of the tabernacle. It says, Moses was careful to do everything that God said on the mountain. 
because Moses wasn't in charge. I mean, he was the leader, but he wasn't in charge because he was submitted. So this is Old Testament. This is the first phase of what's going on. And we see that uh, model going on throughout Joshua and Judges and Samuel, several hundred years where uh, uh, God is the king of Israel and the prophet brings his message. The prophet tells them what God is saying. And then we see in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8, the people want their own king. They want to be like the nations around them. And you may not have read this passage and seen it significant before today, but I want to read to you. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, we're going to read from verse 6. So, this is as it gets to the end of Samuel's life. Samuel's been the prophet. He's been the one that's been hearing God and telling them, uh, the people, what God has been saying. And he's getting old. They know he's going to die soon. And uh, they also know that his sons are not as righteous as he was. So the people say, we want a king. We want a king like the nations around us. And this is what uh, Samuel, uh, it says about Samuel in, in uh, uh, 1 Samuel 8 verse 6 it says Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance that's a good start isn't it <laughs> do everything they say to you the Lord replied for it's not me they are rejecting sorry it's me they are rejecting not you they don't want me to be their king any longer ever since I brought them out from Egypt They've continually abandoned me and followed other gods, and now they're giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to all the people who were asking him for a king. This is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. Some will be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crops. And some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants, he will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and, will, and you will be his slaves. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king as you are demanding, from this king you are demanding, but then the Lord will not help you. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord all the people had said. And the Lord replied, do as they say and give them a king. Then Samuel agreed and sent the people home. And so it, here we see the people of Israel rejecting theocracy, rejecting God as king and wanting a man to be king over them. And we can read on it. We see Saul is appointed as king, and that didn't go well. And pretty soon, uh, uh, Saul is thrown out, and David is appointed king. And, and of the three kings of Israel, because that's all there were, David is the best, and he was a murderer. <laughs> he, you know, counted the people when he shouldn't have done a whole bunch of things wrong, but we do know that he repented of those things. And, and so in a sense, because of that, we look at him and we say, well, at least, you know, when he got it wrong, he, he had the, you know, the courage to face up to what he had done wrong and repent and ask forgiveness. We'll look at that in a moment. And then Solomon, the only three kings of Israel. After that, the kingdom was divided and, and uh, you know, it didn't go so well. And the Jewish people of today and the Jewish people of Jesus' time looked at David's kingdom as the golden era. Oh, when will David's kingdom be restored in Israel? That was the cry of those people at the time of Jesus. When will David's kingdom be restored? But I want to tell you this. The golden era of Israel's kingdom was when God was king. It's when he is ruling, when the prophet is hearing what he is saying and passing it on to the people. In the first century, when Jesus was there, the Jews are waiting for Messiah. 
What are they waiting for Messiah to do? They're waiting for him to restore the kingdom. They're waiting for him to restore, most of them were waiting for him to restore David's kingdom. They expected the kingdom that David had built to be restored and Messiah would come and do it. That's their expectation. That's what they're longing for. That's what they're praying for. When Jesus was born, the the Magi came asking, where is the one born king of the Jews? You know, I want to say that was a mistaken question. They should have been saying, where is the one born king of the world? Because this is not just for the Jews. It's so much more than that. And that's what the Jews were expecting. They were expecting a king to be born and restore the kingdom of Israel. For centuries, the the, the Jews have been looking forward to that. They've been subject to other kings. And if you read the history, they've been subject to the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire and the Medes and the Persians. And then Alexander the Great came and the Greek Empire conquered in between the Old and New Testament. And then for a brief period of about 30 years, the Jews, the Maccabees, rose up and they thought, yes, we're getting it back. And then the Romans came and conquered everything and, you know, They were subject again. And they were waiting for Messiah to come and set them free and restore the kingdom of David. But I want to tell you this, that was not Jesus' purpose when he comes. Jesus doesn't come to restore the kingdom of Israel, but to restore the kingdom of God, to find subjects for the kingdom of God, which is so much wider than this people of Israel. As we read in Galatians, the law is a temporary placeholder until the truth is done, until God's kingdom is restored, until Jesus comes. The law makes God king but demands that people follow the rules. Release and demand or sovereignty and service. But it was a means to a new covenant. It was a means to Messiah coming for all the people of the world to be restored to the kingdom of God. Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 33 says, The Lord says, The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So I want you just to recognize that, first of all, the kingdom of Israel was a theocracy or should have been a theocracy where God was king and the people submitted to him and that it was a means to an end. It was the means in which Messiah would be born. It was the means in which the one who was going to be born to bless the whole world, to forgive all sins, was going to come to this world. So my second point really this morning is this. Jesus came to make subjects, not rule a kingdom. Now, don't misunderstand me. He does rule. But the way he rules is by making subjects, is by us subjecting ourselves to his kingdom. To be clear, the kingdom is already established. Jesus is king, king of kings and lord of lords. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is lord. But at the moment there are people that are rebelling against that. There are people that are refusing to submit to that. And we are them unless we choose to say, I submit myself to you, God. The key to understanding Jesus' ministry on earth is that he came to get subjects, not to establish his sovereignty. He is already king. But what he's asking is that we submit to his authority, that we submit to his kingship, that we say, I'm going to obey you and do what you call me to do. Because Jesus was and is sovereign. We see it while he was on earth, all the miracles he could do. 
he'd see a dead person in the coffin on the way to the funeral and he'd go and say, stop, and he'd open the coffin and the dead person would rise. Or he'd go to his friend Lazarus' grave and he'd say, come on, Lazarus, come out. Or he'd go to somebody who was, you know, a leper and he'd heal their leprosy. He had authority, has authority over these things. They are subject to him. (laughs) Many other miracles. But here's the thing. He was more interested in people being subjects of his than him being sovereign. He was more interested in us coming and bowing our knee and saying, I want to serve you, Jesus, than he was in doing these incredible miracles and all of those things. And you see throughout his ministry at the beginning, he did lots of miracles and the people gathered. But as he went through his ministry, he starts to give them teaching they don't like and they start to go. There's one time when he taught some stuff and it says many left him and he looked at his disciples and saying, are you going as well? Because what he wanted was subjects. And those people that left were not willing to subject themselves to his teaching. They weren't willing to, to bow the knee and say, your Lord. They wanted it on their terms, not his terms. How many of us are like that? We like the miracles. We like the stuff that God does, but we're not willing to submit and bow our knee. When Jesus came, he did something completely unique. And it's demonstrated by, there's a, there's a, there's a day, I think it's the story where the disciples let their friends through the roof. There's a couple of stories where this occurs, but he's lying on the floor and, and the, 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 the Pharisees are waiting to see what he does. And he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees are like, Who's he that he can forgive sins? And Jesus said, I'm doing this to show that I have authority to forgive sins. I have authority to forgive sins. Because he's king. He can forgive our sins if he wants to. He has the authority to do that. So he says this, so you know that I have an authority on earth to forgive sins. And so the thing that Jesus does is completely unique because he moves in sovereign power to forgive our sins. In the Old Testament, we see he moves in sovereign power to set the people free from slavery, and he moves in sovereign power to provide water and manna in the desert and all of these things. Well, for us, he moves in sovereign power miraculously to forgive our sins, that we are born again into the kingdom of God. And so in the Old Testament, we see this thing where God releases them and then he demands obedience. Well, in the New Testament, we don't see that. We see that we are released from sin, set free from sin, and then he pours his Holy Spirit on us. By his grace, he gives us so much more than we deserve. You see, in the New Testament, it's release and righteousness. He makes us righteous by his Holy Spirit. He comes and he does a work within us, sovereignly forgives our sins and then pours his Holy Spirit on us that we can be like him. And so we don't have to follow laws, but we live in grace. If we continue to read that chapter that we, uh, actually it's a little bit further on in Galatians where we read, it says, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patient, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is this. If we submit ourselves to him and his authority, he forgives our sins and then in us pours his Spirit that we can grow like him, that we can grow fruit. Love, joy, peace, patient, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He doesn't demand that we be subject to his commands, but he grows his kingdom in us, the fruit of the kingdom in us. We don't follow laws, but live in grace. You know, David understood something of this, and I mentioned David before. 
he understood something of this thing where God forgives and then uh, gives us righteousness. This New Testament idea that when Jesus, by his grace, he forgives our sins and then he gives us a righteousness. Let me read to you from Psalm 51, I think it's verse 7 I'm reading from. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. As I've said, you know, he was a, an adulterer and a murderer, and yet God, in his sovereignty, forgives our sins. Give me back my joy again. You've broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. David saw something in the prophetic here of what was to come. Released from sin, forgiven of sin, and then the Holy Spirit is poured in to make us righteous. Forgiveness and cleansing, these are what Jesus offers. You know, under this new covenant, the miracle of salvation is a demonstration of God's sovereign power. When we're born again, it's a miracle. God does a miracle that our sins are forgiven and we are born into his family. We're made children of God and I don't have time to go into all of that this morning. But then we're filled with his Holy Spirit to live as his subjects. I don't, again, I don't have time. We may return to this at some point. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus stands there, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you can read through that, that, that sermon that Jesus gave, and it says constantly things like, you have heard it said, but I say to you, because Jesus is saying, this is what it is to be a subject of my kingdom. And all the things, you know, the, the things like think of others more highly than yourselves. Think, things, well, love your enemies. All of those famous teachings of Jesus, in a sense, are part of that Sermon on the Mount. Part of this kingdom where we're set free and then we're filled with the Holy Spirit to live righteously. Just briefly before I close, for the sake of completion, but I could preach a whole other sermon on this one day. The kingdom is to come. Jesus is king. At the moment, we choose voluntarily to be subject to his kingdom. When he returns, everyone will bow their knee. Whether they choose now to subject themselves or not, one day every knee will bow, every king and every lord and every ruler and every authority will bow to the king of kings when Jesus returns, whether they like it or not. And I've said to you many times, I want to be one of the volunteers. I want to be one that bows my knee to him voluntarily right now. The kingdom is already established. We are his subjects. But one day Jesus will force the rebellious to bow their knee as well before him. Last week after I preached, we had several people coming to like want to bring words and obviously Jim came forward and then they, Katie came so he went back and then he wrote me an email and uh, I'm going to read you a chunk of his email now. You know that Jim studies deeply. His brain works in a completely different way than mine and uh, <laughs> So he wrote an email to me, and it's just some of his studies about old English words. I've never thought about studying old English words. We're talking old English, we're talking English from a thousand years ago. So anyway, this is part of the email that uh, Jim wrote me last week. I hope you don't mind me reading out, Jim. He <laughs> it, says, it's not an accident that our modern word for monarch, king, is similar to another term in modern English for family member, kin. Both words are descended from Old English. Old English is a form of English spoken over a thousand years ago. In Old English, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's C-Y-N, so we say kin. 
meant a family member. It's essentially the same word as, uh, with a different spelling. And kinning meant monarch. Kinning got shortened to king over time. So let's think about this word kinning. It's easy to spot that it's the word a family member coupled with an ing. So king is kin but with an ing on the end. That makes it sound like an active verb. The king. In Old English, a person who brings together and sustains a community. They are a patriarch sustaining a family that is broader than blood. This is a period in history where concepts like the divine right of kings or the automatic of succession of heirs didn't exist. You know that today, you know, the, the, the monarch, their children become king after them. Then that wasn't the case. It was the strongest and the one who, you know, well, I'll go on because that's what Jim says. Um, you became a king by being the best at conquest and people pledged their service to kings that treated their people well. In this time, kingdoms were small, often made up of related family groups. And if you did a bad job, your citizens could just pledge themselves to someone with a bigger sword. Kings are also referred to in the Old English as, in Old English texts, as ring givers because they gave out riches to their followers. Kings were judged by history on how they treated their people and shared their wealth. So in the roots of the modern word, king is a, is a principle that a king should be the father of their community and an expectation that the followers of a king would be treated well like family. As time progressed and kingdoms became larger, these ideas began to fall away in practical terms, although they are still preserved in the words we use. When we talk about King Jesus and the kingdom of God, it helps me to remember the roots of the word king because it describes a synthesis of ruling and sovereignty and paternal care and protection. He is at once in charge the organizing principle and the source of comfort. And it's ultimately the, land, the kind of kingship we read about in the ultimate image of God's kingdom as described in Revelation. That, when I read that, I just I thought, that's fantastic. You know, God is king and he's sovereign and he's father and he's protector and, and all of those things that Jim has described there. And in a sense, you know, this old English word that we use now, that's the concept. That's what we see in our King of Kings. He is our Father. He is our protector. He sustains us and keeps us. He promises us his riches. All of this is true of the King of Kings. Just to close with this morning, I just want to remind you of this. Jesus' kingdom is about individuals. He came not to force his sovereignty, but to call us to be his subjects. I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 13. I forgot to put bookmarks in this morning. Luke 13, verse 18. And these, this is, this is a... This, this passage is sometimes known as like the short kingdom parables because there's a bunch of parables about the kingdom of God which are like one line long. Um, I need to go over the page. It, uh, verse 18, it, this is Jesus talking. It says, uh, what is the kingdom of God like? How can I illustrate it? It's like a tiny mustard seed that a man planted in the garden. It grows and becomes a tree and the bird makes nest birds make nests in its branches and then another what else is the kingdom of God like it's like the yeast a woman used in making bread even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour it permeated every part of the dough and it goes on and there's a bunch of these short little parables about the kingdom of God and the thing I want to notice is it's about a man and it's about a woman it's not about a nation or a community it's about these people seeing value in something. 
And Jesus is calling for individuals to be subject to his kingdom. When we see it that way, it calls for a response from us as individuals. How am I going to respond? Am I going to bow my knee before him? It also answers one of the really big questions of life. Why does God allow suffering? I'm often asked this. Why doesn't God come in his sovereign power and impose on all of this planet order and righteousness and justice? It's because the kingdom is about individuals. He could. He could come and impose and one day he will. But right at this moment, he's seeking subjects for his kingdom. Right at this moment, he's saying, I want individuals to bow my knee voluntarily. I want them to choose to follow me, not be forced to follow me. Because that is what he wants from us. That is what he has given us, the right to choose. And we know that pretty much all suffering is caused by man's selfishness. By individuals saying, I want what's best for me and not what everyone else. I want to do, you know, I want to be rich. I want to be famous. I want to be, I want to be. And when people ask me that question, why does God allow suffering? This is my answer. If he's going to change man's hearts, if he's going to make us righteous and justice, are you willing for him to start with you? Am I willing for him to start with me? Because this is a kingdom of individuals. And too often people are saying, why doesn't God come and change everything? But they're not willing to allow him to change them. Or well, I'm not willing for him to change me. And the answer to that question is he wants to, but he needs us to subject ourselves to him. He wants to create righteousness and justice. He wants to, to, to make sure that nobody goes hungry. He wants to make sure that nobody is in prison or abused or, or all the horrible things that are going on in our world today. But what it means is individuals need to submit. And so this morning... I'm here in the room with you and I want to ask, are you willing to submit? Am I willing to submit? Am I willing to give up my selfishness? Am I willing to give up my personal ambition? Am I willing to give up my dogmatic ideas and bow my knee to Jesus? Am I willing to be subject to the King of Kings? And I'm going to pray. and You'll understand what I'm going to pray is, God, I want to make myself, I want to be a subject of you. God, forgive me, a sinner. Do that sovereign work of grace in me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I can grow fruit of righteousness and justice but that me means that I have to say to him Jesus you are my Lord you're my God I submit myself to you and what you say and what you do the way you want to lead me let's pray Father King of the universe we come to you this morning to submit ourselves you are our King. You are our Lord. Father, forgive us for our sin. Forgive us for our failing, for our selfishness, for the way we treat one another, for the things that we think and the things that we say and the things that we do which offend you. Father, forgive us. Forgive me. This morning we bow our knee. We bow our knee to you as king. Your will be done. Your kingdom come, we pray.
in my life. That you will be king. That you will be sovereign. I subject myself to you. God, I pray you'd help us. So often the flesh rises up in rebellion. Help us to submit. Help us to resist temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. That we can serve you and follow you. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing. And I've forgotten the song that we're going to sing. <laughs> there is a king seated among us. Can we put the words up? Oh, we don't have the words. Oh, something's gone wrong with the computer. Oh, dear. You might just need to listen to the words and make it your prayer this morning as we just uh, go through this song.
There is a name that reigns above all others, Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. What a great way to end a declaration of who Jesus is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Let's just pray together to finish. Father God, I just pray that this week, as we go about our work, whatever it is that we're going to be doing this week, Father, I just pray that we'll remember that, that daily, daily we will just choose to submit ourselves to you, to acknowledge you as king of our lives. Help us to do that this week, Father. Amen. Amen. It is great that you've joined us this morning. Great that we've had so many in the room today. Great that you've joined us online if you have. Um, Just quick little reminders that our giving is all online. Um, If you've not worked out how to do that, you can um, head to our website. There's a donate button there. If you want to give regularly, you can email us and set up standing orders and all of that kind of thing as well. So that's all happening still online. We would love to see you next week. Um, So get yourselves booked on, ready for next week. Um, And if you've not joined us yet, then please do come and join us here so that we can worship together. But we hope you have um, a blessed week. Take care, everyone.